One of the oddest things with this tribe is that they don't even eat and yet they have no disease. Because when you look at the science around it, you have the groups of people who say, keto diets, paleo diets, they cause cancer. The point is, is that when you look at studies on keto, it's absolutely anti-cancer and all these amazing benefits. No culture ever has been plant-based, only plant-based. So vegetarians, I'm sorry, it just doesn't happen. Because every time you change diet, magic happens, and there's a reason for that. So yes, feasting is somehow in our DNA blueprint that creates magic and actually can make us leaner. Pretty cool. Glad to be here. So I owe Ben one Bitcoin. I bet him that there is no chance he can go through 117 slides in 40 minutes. I didn't even think he could do it in 60 minutes. And last night, you're like, do you realize we only have 40 minutes? Oh my God, I better shorten my talk. I better get going because I have 54, 53, and I have less chance of making it than Ben. I can promise you that, but I'm gonna make it because I want that Bitcoin. Two missing strategies to stay lean and healthy. All right, not only missed, but filled with myths. Something in my life changed my whole paradigm on diet. It's when I first met this tribe back in 2005. One of the three hunting, gathering tribes in the world, someone told me at that time. This tribe just came down from the mountains. You know why? Because it was five years, I believe, maybe six of a drought. And what they were foraging on, once that started drying up, it pushed them out. And I had the pleasure of meeting them. Last night at dinner, there was Ben, Mindy, who's next, and myself and, and some others. And I told some pretty amazing stories about this time. I don't know how I got on that. And I did say, well, I'm gonna tell part of that story tomorrow about how my paradigm changed. Okay, I, you're probably thinking that's kind of boring because we're here for keto and you probably learn more about keto. Mm -mm, not so simple. I learned about a concept that really got me thinking right there. And through the years, it changed me. They fasted when I was there at that point. They were just coming out of a fast. I taught fasting back when no one really was into fasting. That was in the 1990s. Yeah, I'm dating myself. But um, I was very interested to know how long they fasted, why they were fasting, of course. And they would fast because they had to preserve their food, right? So they would definitely go without food. They would maybe feed the kids and the, you know, the adults would fast. I got all the information I could from the people that I was there with. One of the interesting things is, is, was is that when we were at dinner, one of the pastors that had brought me back said, Dr. Pompa, I have to say, one of the oddest things with this tribe is that they don't even eat, and yet they have no disease. So he was correlating food, or the lack of, with, you know, not like the way I was with disease. And all the other tribes where World Vision was coming in and bringing them grain, etc., already were starting to develop diabetes, heart disease, typical diseases. This tribe didn't have words for heart disease, cancer, osteoporosis. I mean, he was sitting there, I was asking him questions, he was asking the tribe chief questions, and I was just fascinated. They did something else that changed my paradigm. Not only did they fast, but of course, they would move in and out of ketosis because when they had game, that's what they ate. But when they didn't, they were actually on an oddly high carbo healthy carbohydrate diet. So literally I was like, okay, that's interesting. And then they did something else. I would say, where are the men? And the men were out hunting. They would leave at like 3, 34 in the morning because it was so hot and they would go out and they would be gone until maybe three in the afternoon. They would go out without any food and barely any water, if any at all, because they would track down their prey. And they didn't need weight, 
they didn't want water, so they would drive fast and come back later in the afternoon and the tribe and them would eat one big meal. So what concept for the first time was I introduced to? Intermittent fasting daily. And I was also amazed at how they were forced to vary their diet. Now, with that knowledge, should I stay in keto my whole life? Well, that's an interesting question. Because when you look at the science around it, you have the groups of people who say, keto diets, paleo diets, they cause cancer. Because see, there's something that they reference in studies, and I'll jump to the bottom there, 4-HNE, 4-hydroxy, I don't know. And what that is, is a nasty free radical that absolutely causes cancer. The studies are robust, and I put them there at the bottom. But the point is, is that when you look at studies on keto, it's absolutely anti-cancer and all these amazing benefits. So if you look at that, at first keto drives this free radical, ROS, because you're oxidizing lipids. And you know, people feel a little crappy at first, right? And we call it the keto flu, whatever we want to call it. But then your cells adapt. And we're going to talk a little bit about adaptation in a minute because that's key. So they increase glutathione, other antioxidants pathways to deal with the oxidative stress. So that upregulation from the adaptation, this is your first lesson by the way, of the stress creates magic in the body. And then we get the magic of keto. And by the way, that magic could last months, years for certain people. Our genetics determine how long we can stay in any one diet and actually be successful. So then what happens, if you stay on the diet too long, we know now that 4-hydroxynetolone actually starts to build up in your cells, your membranes, and your tissues. And then we see these studies that actually can be linked to cancer and other problems. Now, I'm not just picking on low-carb diets because I love keto, do you understand? I use keto, I've been teaching keto before keto was cool. I couldn't help the very sick and challenged people that I do without keto. Love it. Ketones, your brain loves them, can go on and on. But long term, no culture, forget about the science, no culture ever in the history of this planet has stayed on any one diet. Do you realize that? Now let's pick on the plant-based people. No culture ever has been plant-based, only plant-based. So vegetarians, I'm sorry, it just doesn't happen. The tribe that I met, when they had it, when they had meat, they ate meat. When they didn't, they foraged, they were eating a higher carbohydrate diet, this stuff uh, called baobab and these fruits that were absolutely incredible from this tree. I mean, amazing. But they were forced to change their diet. Oh, by the way, you see there, we have a lot today about lectins and phytates and nightshades and are they bad? Well, you're gonna learn about a premise in a moment called hormesis. And I believe those plant toxins act hormetically in our gut and they stress our microbiome. And when they stress the microbiome, it creates an adaptation, there's the word again, and what happens is magic, biological magic. It creates diversity in the microbiome. And I'm a believer, the only way to create diversity, and by the way, let me back up, all the testing we've done with the microbiome, we thought it was gonna tell us what to eat, we thought it was gonna do this, we thought it, really the only real thing we've got out of it is healthy people have diverse microbiomes, unhealthy people don't, that's it. So then the question is, is how do we get a diverse microbiome and I'll tell you, it's not, and I'm not against taking probiotics or prebiotics, I'm for it and I will give that to people. However, the only real way is to stress the microbiome. You're gonna learn more about fasting with me and Dr. Mindy, but also diet change stresses the microbiome, forces it to adapt, and then we create diversity. Lectins, phytates, nightshades, they stress the microbiome. 
and they can create diversity. Now, if you stay on that diet too long, you know those little suckers start to cause holes in your mucous membranes and start to cause irritation and inflammation. Not good. And by the way, there's a lot of other things that go bad with methylation cycles and fats if you stay on that diet too long. But the point is, is any one diet too long is not good. The magic is in the change. Say that. Here's the stories you hear. I started, if you ask somebody, how did you end up a vegan or a vegetarian? Gosh, I moved to that diet and I just felt so much better. I'm sure you did. There's a lot of reasons why. Well, I'm paleo because I moved that diet, changed my life. I'm sure that happened. Keto, I did that, I changed my life. Yes, because every time you change diet, magic happens and there's a reason for that. We're gonna talk about it. I love this video, I don't have time to actually show it. But you know, bodybuilders prove this. So quickly, I'll just tell the story. I'm gonna date myself once again, but I'm gonna date some of you. How many of you know Tom Platts, the bodybuilder? We got one. That's it? That's it, you and me, Tom Platts, the guy with the biggest quads ever? All right, he was back from the Arnold Schwarzenegger days. Now, of course, by, you know, 100% of you know who Arnold is, right? Because he carried on, but Tom got out of it. But there was a guy named Mike Menser. You remember Mike Menser? Of course, he was like the scientist of all the bodybuilders, right? He was the guy that figured it out that they went to. So Arnold got into the, you know, absolute low carb. I mean, he did the whole thing, right? So they all just did what Arnold did, man. He was the man. So Tom Platts did that and he had two of his best career achievements that he ever had when he moved to the Arnold diet, low carb, the whole thing. And then he went flat. Mike Menser said, Tom, you can't stay on that diet. You gotta vary it. And he talks about that in this video of how Mike Menser told him to change his diet and he said, it transformed my career. I grew bigger muscle, harder muscle, and I was leaner than ever by going higher healthy carbohydrates. And he talks about that premise. The bodybuilders figured it out. Now again, they didn't stay on higher healthy carbohydrates, some of them did, but the magic was this exchange. Matter of fact, what do bodybuilders do days before a competition? Do you know they go high carb? Did you know that? Some of you may not, but they do that to get lean and ripped and it pops their veins and they look leaner and they do that for a reason, this reason. All right, I want you to understand the concept. Problem, this problem is probably the first problem we have to solve, okay? So why would the bodybuilders right before a competition go high carb? It's this reason. When you're low carb for a long time, your body has one thing it wants to do always survive that's it it'll save your life no matter what for you short term maybe not so much but it wants to save your life or I'm sorry long term not so much so what, what happens when you're low carb so long your body says wait a minute I don't want to burn this precious fat I want to hold on to it because that is my lifeline for survival so after a while it wants to slow down lipolysis burning fat and it does it two ways it can fill fat cells with water and make them less burny. Oh, and that's not good. You know why? That's when you start getting that little dimply fat. That's not good because we call that what? Yeah. But it also, if you've read some things that people send you, your friends that want to save you from keto diet, they'll say, do you know a keto diet actually causes insulin resistance? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know what insulin resistance is. Well, well, it kind of does actually, but it's not insulin resistance like the diabetic gets. It's insulin resistance from innate intelligence that literally sends a signal from the mitochondria, the DNA, to the receptor that insulin attaches to and says, blunt, <laughs> hear it less, insulin less. Why is it doing that? Because insulin is a fat storing hormone and it wants you to hold on to fat. So what's the answer to this then? If you want to break out of this zone, you need some carb days. Feast days are as important as the fast, as important as the, you know, the keto, the low carb. So yes, feasting is somehow in our DNA blueprint that creates magic and actually can make us leaner. Pretty cool. 
So this concept that I got from the tribe, feast, famine, cycling, that's what they were forced to do. Our DNA is set up for it. Yeah, you can take a picture of it, but that is weekly. And Mindy's going to go over some clever monthly strategies with you and seasonally. So let's just talk about weekly, right? So during the week, I always have at least one or two days. And by the way, some of you ladies and thyroid and adrenal people, you might do better with three feast days where you just eat maybe as much as you want. I'm going to build on this later, but there's three things that would define a, fe a feast. High protein, high calories, or high carb. Your body goes into what is called an mTOR pathway with any of those. Bodybuilders want to do all of those because they want to feast and be mTOR because that puts on muscle. But I will argue, again, we know high protein diets too long, high calorie diets too long cause disease. Yes, they do. But please, Fasting is very in vogue right now. Too much fasting creates another pathway, autophagy, which is amazing short term, but too much of it, you end up catabolic and you actually lower your immune system. The magic is in the feast and the famine. Today, I'm, in, uh, I'm, I'm reminding people that the feast is as important as the famine. 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, I was reminding people, forget about it. You need some fasting. You need some famine in your life. Today, we're, and especially in these groups, we have to remind ourselves that the feast is important. Maybe not so much this group. You guys are three percenters. Monthly, five days of high carbs or high protein can be magic. Ladies and Mindy will build on this. The five days before your cycle, you think those cravings are just random and it's just you that you want to break out of your diet, you want to eat chocolate? No, your innate intelligence knows something. It knows it wants to raise up insulin because insulin helps hormone conversions, especially thyroid, to convert T4, inactive thyroid hormone, to T3. You actually need insulin. So yes, you should feast before a cycle. It's magic. Men, we can randomly just do five days of any of those things that create a feast. But you know what? You want to change your world? Do five days of famine. It might be even a partial fast where you're eating under 1,000 calories for five days. And I want to be clear, caloric restriction long-term does not work. It lowers your metabolism. Your body will think it's starving. But when you do it in short cycles, it's magic. Protein, high protein, high calorie, long-term, your body will, in fact, start developing cancer cells through mTOR. And you will age prematurely. But when you do it in short cycles, it's magic. This is what ancient cultures do. Today, we have the science to prove it. Intermittent caloric restriction in studies is way better for weight loss, metabolic disease, and aging. So the cycles, the cycles of caloric restriction with normal eating forces the body to adapt. That's very important. And that's where I'm going next. It forces the body to adapt. So when you're eating in a famine style, and then you feast, your body has to adapt. What are the first things in your body that start the adaptation process? Bacteria adapt first. Your microbiome has to shift. And in that shift, it creates a hormone optimization because then the hormones want to start the shift. And so now we've optimized our biology by forcing adaptation. We're building on that. Another study. In this particular study, I interviewed Karen Verde. She was one of the, I, I can't say she was one of the first, but she definitely got her study out there for whatever reason. Alternate day fasting. So here's what they did in the study. Standard American diet, 500 calories. Standard American diet, 500 calories. That's a partial fast. And they compared it to every diet we could possibly do, think about, right? Low calorie, low fat, I mean, whatever it was, this diet, beat out every one of them for metabolic health and fat loss. Why? Why do you think? Because weight loss has less to do with the food that you eat and more to do with our hormones. So Karen, why do you think that was? Well, it's easy. 
because it forced the body to adapt, and it adapts via a hormone optimization. That's it. Pretty simple. Do you know when you go into a cold bath? How many do cold baths? Or that's, right, the, the cold plunges? Not too many, okay. It's a, bio, it's a biohack that can kick fat loss. There's some people shaking their head, and my wife's one of them. And, um, but the reason it works is because your body goes, oh my God, I'm gonna die. And it re upregulates something called norepinephrine to save your life. Just so happens norepinephrine downregulates inflammation massively. Oh, it just so happens that norepinephrine upregulates growth hormone. And it, it makes your cells more sensitive to other hormones. You get this hormone optimization. You walk out of there, you feel great. Oh, and it kicks you into fat loss. That's it. Oh, and it changes your microbiome. <laughs> but three minutes in cold bath. I mean, who the heck wants to do that, right? No, not, not me. Okay, so I kind of led to this. The answer, why, you know, where does the answer lie? How, well, what is going on? Why does it work? What is hormesis? Because that's the real answer of why this whole thing works. This is the best answer. I've kind of led you to this right now, or this is the best example I could give you. Most people here, this seems like the very exercisey crowd, so good example. If you don't exercise, you're on the first part of that graph, right? Not good not to exercise, that's really bad. There's a lot of reasons why, even at the level of the cell, mitochondria, of course, muscles, bones, right? But what about the, again, I'm gonna go back to the 80s, like when you know I was around in the heyday of exercise, what was big? It was the, uh, the aerobics, right? These aerobics instructors were doing literally 20 classes a week. And I literally remember going, these girls jump around in there all day long. You think that they would be lean. They all had a certain look. You know what I'm talking about. See, too much exercise becomes a problem. Too little becomes a problem. We, right in that sweet spot, we call that the hormetic zone. That's when your body adapts and you get the most benefit because exercise is a stress. Do you all understand that? So what, it, what makes you stronger? The exercise while you're exercising? No, you get stronger later because of the adaptation, there's the word, to the exercise. How does the body adapt? Tell me, what did I t teach you already? How does your body adapt? What's the first thing that happens? bacteria, then you get a hormone optimization, and all these wonderful things happen if you adapt, or if you create a stress high enough to adapt. So now, here we go, right? You haven't exercised in a year, you get back in the gym, and you do whatever exercise, oh my gosh, the results just come so fast. It's like that first time you changed the diet. The person went to the vegetarian diet or whatever it was. You get these amazing results. And then you just keep doing the same exercise and all of a sudden you're not getting the same results. And matter of fact, according to studies, you're actually, you don't just plateau because your body doesn't have a stress anymore. It's not perceiving a stress. Therefore, you're not getting the adaptation because exercise by itself does nothing for you. It's the adaptation from innate intelligence. So you're going along and then all of a sudden, According to studies, you actually start diminishing results. Yes, arguably you're better off sitting at home. It doesn't do anything for you. It's actually working against you. So what do you do? You hire a trainer and the trainer, he starts making you do new things and your results go through the roof and he's so wonderful. No, he just understands the principle of exercise variation. Every time you go in the gym, you should be doing something different. Maybe I just taught you something. But that's what the good trainers know. They make you do different things. All the Olympic athletes come in and train in our gym. They're always doing different things. I hired a trainer just to make me do different things because I can't come up with it half the time. <laughs> so different things, why? Because it forces the body to adapt. Every time it's new, your body has to adapt. Diet, no difference. Does that make sense to you? Make sense, group? Make sense? Make sense? Okay. Now we can build on something, right? That's, who, who knows who that is? Wim Hof, the Iceman. This guy can stay in that bath all day. If any of us stayed in that bath all day, we'd probably die. So what did Wim Hof do to be able to adapt, 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 adapt? He, we, he raised his hormetic ceiling, as we call it. So Wim Hof 
stressed himself adapt, stressed himself adapt, stressed himself adapt, different ways, multiple ways, and he created this incredible adaptation. If Wim Hof stayed in that ice bath for three minutes, would he benefit? No, thank you. No, very good, ma'am, very good. He would not benefit because it would not be stressful enough. I had the conversation with someone last night and I said to them, if you stayed in the ice bath for three minutes, you would not only not benefit, it would be negative for you because of her inability to adapt to temperature change. So here's what the question is, right? And it was asked to me last night. So how long should we stay in an ice bath? And I said, man, that's, that's up to your innate intelligence, right? That's like saying, should I do Tom Pl or Arnold Schwarzenegger, whoever, that, their exercise program? The answer is hell no. It's too much stress, right? But the point is, is that we have to listen to our innate intelligence to tell us how much we should be stressing, how much we should be changing. But this principle of hormesis, I love principle, because if you follow it, I'm telling you, this applies to everything in your life. If you can stress your body appropriately and adapt, you get stronger. Even emotional stress, believe it or not, if you can stress appropriately and, appropriately and adapt, you get stronger. How do we raise our hormetic ceiling then? How do we raise our body's ability to adapt? We have to stress, but we also can take things like certain supplements and make us be able to adapt better, right? We can eat more food, we can do our better food. I mean, all of these things that we do help us adapt, right? It does, but let's keep building on this. I did mention this. I said it is about adaptation. This particular study, they took mice that they literally triggered a gene for to keep, where they had weight loss resistance, couldn't lose weight. And they exposed them to hot, cold temperatures. Stress, stress, stress. And then they kicked in, they were able to lose weight. One of the things they found is it was the microbiome shift that actually changed the hormone sensitivity and therefore kicked in the ability to lose weight. Fasting, is fasting a stress? Of course it is. Matter of fact, it only works because it's a stress. It's a great stress. That's why people have to be careful with fasting. Very sick and challenged people just go on fast. And I'll be signing my book here in, in a moment, you know, but that's not good. You don't run a marathon. You train for a marathon. You don't just fast for two weeks without food. Some of people in here may be far healthy enough to do that, but many are not. So you have to get your body ready for that hormetic stress. And then when you adapt, amazing stuff happens. If you don't adapt to a fast, bad things happen. That's all that slide said. Fasting is a stress that applies to hormesis. That's a study. We know that this is how fasting works, right? It improves weight and other risk-related outcomes, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, because we're stressing the body. And by the way, one of the, the new things about fasting is, yes, we're stressing our mitochondria. And I always say bad cells don't adapt. Good cells adapt and become stronger. In my book, I call it mitochondrial fitness. The only way you're gonna get your mitochondria better is stress them. But we have to understand the principle, just like exercise. So I would say fasting is exercise for the mitochondria. Diet change, exercise for the mitochondria. Do you realize how stressful it is for the mitochondria to have to switch fuels? To go from sh uh, sugar, glucose, all of a sudden to fat burning? Sick people, do they do that well? No, they get into ketosis and they're like, my ketones aren't even going up. You know, or my ketones are going out, my brain won't use them. I mean, you know, I'm still brain fog. I'm, I'm not losing weight. Maybe I'm gaining weight. Your mitochondria is not using fat. You better stress it, exercise it before we get to the point where we can fast or keto, right? So there's things we have to do with this principle. Fasting increases microbiome diversity. That's what I was telling you. Look at the bottom there. Diversity increased as a result of fasting in those animals. So we want to fast to increase. I, I mentioned the types of extended fast. I'm a very believer in extended fast. I think every one of you should do one or two fasts a year. According to Thomas Seyfried, it'll decrease your cancer risk 95%, minimum. 
Now, you might not want to water fast. I love water fasting, but I don't just water fast. I also partial fast. I mentioned that. Just dropping calories and protein in a partial fast. You have to get your protein under 20 grams. Otherwise, it knocks you out of the pathway called autophagy, which is when your body eats the bad stuff. And that's the magic of fasting, by the way, is your body, you know, of course we create the diversity in the microbiome, but for survival, for energy, your body's too smart to eat good cells. It knows the good DNA, it knows the good cells, it knows the good mitochondria, and it goes after the bad ones, the senescent cells, the cells that live too long and create inflammation in ages prematurely and put us at risk for many of the diseases that we're seeing today. So do you want a lot of senescent cells? No. What's the cheapest way to get rid of them? Fast. That's autophagy. Mitophagy means your body gets rid of bad mitochondria and it will get rid of bad mitochondria and replace it with new ones and a new cell. Here's how it works. It eats the bad one, but the intelligence goes, we need a new one. It stimulates a stem cell and it recreates a new cell. Ah, so Dr. Bob, that would make, then I could renew myself if I just fasted periodically. Bingo, you're right. But what's more important or as important as the fast? What is it? Feast. Okay, if ben, Ben's not allowed to answer any more questions, over here. The feast. If you're fasting, you better feast. That message you're not hearing, feast famine. We want to feast and famine. That's the magic. Does feasting with fasting increase the hormetic effect? It does. So in other words, if you want greater stress and hormesis, you want to feast and famine. And that's what I learned from the tribe. Pretty cool. There's the two pathways, right? And the, the key is the magic between the pathways. So what drives autophagy? Fasting, low carb, low protein, right? So in keto, we actually get some autophagy, especially when we first go in it. Look at this. Did anyone pick up on this yet? They're exact opposites, aren't they? These two pathways oppose one another. We have right now in the natural health world, we have two groups of people. People that are all for the fasting, the low carb, the low protein, and then people who are into the feasting, higher carb, blah, 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 and they battle back and forth because people want to argue for their diet. The magic is the variation, the change. Magic happens in the change. Does the body have to adapt to diet changes? Yes. You already knew the answer to the first one. The microbiome was the first thing to adapt, right? Then hormone optimization occurs. See, I kind of built you up to this so you knew the answer to this slide. And then the, the metabolism starts to shift, right? And now your mitochondria are starting to be able to feed from different sources, right? Because your body's used to going back and forth. Here's what happens during exercise. You have an increase in growth hormone, neuroepinephrine, I mentioned that earlier. Your hormone sensitivity increases, which is really amazing, by the way. Your, uh, neutral, uh, your luteinizing hormone increases, therefore testosterone. Mitochondrial function increases. Okay, if exercise stays the same, benefits plateau. You learned that. You must vary your routine to keep those amazing hormone results happening. The same thing happens when you shift your diet. Pretty amazing. And it starts right here with the microbiome. Pretty cool, except it's not so cool because most of us eat the same damn eight foods all the time. Would you agree with that? Because it's what we do, it's easy. We like them, they work for us, so we do that. But now let's just strip everything I just taught you aside, let's make it really simple. Do you realize that when you're giving these guys the same food all the time, there's no reason to you know, basically diversify and make more new bacteria? You're feeding the same, let's make up a number, thousand guys that like those fibers and foods. But when you shift into a carnivore diet for a period of time, Oh, wait a minute. Now, these guys, all these new bacteria have to flare up to adapt to get you to produce more hydrochloric acid. Oh yeah, that's what happens, it's that smart. Bacteria here can actually, will all of a sudden upregulate, your innate intelligence does that, by the way, and it produce, starts producing more hydrochloric acid, and then therefore you're able to break down more fats and proteins, et cetera, and more bile, all that amazing stuff happens. Your body's that smart. 
When and why would I do this if you're not fat adapting? Stop losing weight? Yeah, I can't lose this. I think everyone should do it anyway, of course. No energy in ketosis. Hormone conditions of any type, especially thyroid, you need more variation. All these things. All right, I said there were two. In five minutes, we're gonna dive into this one, okay? As quick as I can, but it's so important. Okay, this is the real reason why people still don't feel well. I've changed my diet, Dr. Pomba. I've done this change, I exercise. I do better than all my friends. I still don't feel great. What is it? I'm gonna get the answer. Massive rise in obesity, autism surging. He gave you the statistics on that. Dementia, thyroid pandemic. Oh my gosh, you, you realize the last two years thyroid conditions doubled? Okay, there's a reason for that. It's called post-COVID. Make sure you see one of my videos out there on that because that's a cellular danger response. And there's a reason for that. We're gonna talk about it in five minutes, believe it or not. Will just a clean diet and lifestyle change get your life back? What's the answer to that? No, it's not so simple. Because this room, you've done that. And you better do that because if you don't do that, you're gonna be in trouble. But okay, so I'm not, we don't have time to get into the obesity thing. We know it's just soared every year, every year, and it's doubled. I mean, it's, it's half the population right now. So what is the real cause? Well, most experts believe it's chemicals. Honestly, it's chemicals that are the problem. It's not my opinion, even though I'm the cellular detox guy, it's not. This is rooted in science. If you look at the explosion of thyroid, you know it's called the canary in the coal mine? Because that means they literally brought canaries down in the coal mine because they would die first if there was a bad gas. They were sensitive to chemicals. The thyroid, if you have a thyroid condition, you have a chemical exposure. You do. That's a problem. But who's getting to the real cause of the hormone crisis in this country? I assure you, diet is part of it, but this is the bigger problem. Our buckets are filled because we're accumulating these toxins at the cellular level. Once it overflows, all of those symptoms start. You can read them for yourself. And most people, even in the natural world, what are we doing? We're taking supplements, we're taking things to deal with those symptoms instead of saying, wait a minute, what's in my bucket? Granted, some of you genetically have bigger buckets than others, some of you smaller. But the fact is, is how do we get people who don't feel well and have done everything well, we empty that bucket, but we do it at every cell in the body. That's the key. That's how I got my life back, and I don't have time to tell my story, but I was sick and everything I learn and teach doctors around the world now came out of my story from pain to purpose and I knew God had a promise for me because my wife told me that. <laughs> God's not only gonna get you well, but he's gonna take a message to the world through you. And she was right. And I didn't even wanna hear it because I couldn't even get myself well at that time. But the information I teach came out of that. And it's more than diet. From mom to baby into utero, transferred for four generations. You not only have a problem with the toxins you brought in, but you have a problem with the toxins you inherited from mom. And in a minute, I'll show you that. I experienced it in my family. Epigenetically, toxins turn on, trigger genes, turn them on. And unfortunately, they're turned on for four generations. Therefore, you can be born doomed to gain weight because a gene was triggered. There's good news, because you can turn the genes off. And that's part of the strategy that I've been teaching people. The lead generation, I'm gonna just quickly talk about it, two, three generations, the lead generation, four generations. That's my wife's lead test. My kids all inherited my wife's lead. They had all these digestive issues, different issues, despite us doing everything perfect. I thought, oh, I have to test their lead. Their lead was off the chart. Lead is stored in bone. And during pregnancy, it's very normal to lose bone, but out comes the lead. Our parents, we grew up in the lead generation. Everything had lead in it before 1978. And it is deep in the bones. And there's times of life like puberty and obviously uh, pregnancy that lead comes out. Mercury generation. Mercury, I wore contact lenses, that's what got me sick. Silver fillings, 
contact lenses. It was mercury thimerosal into the early 90s. And of course, vaccines and other mercury sources. Here's the problem. You can't get rid of mercury by just doing a sauna. There's no 10 day cleanse. It's not so simple. You have to chelate it and get it out of the brain. That's the problem. So, whoops, I'm going backwards. That's a study called the giraffe study. Ladies, the number of fillings you have in your mouth is proportional on studies to how much uh, mercury they find in the baby's brain. We get our first exposure in utero from mom. We have kids today, teenagers, being diagnosed with dementia. That's a silver filling. You can Google the, uh, the smoking tooth video and that silver filling contains 50% mercury and off gases mercury into your brain for the life of that filling. Don't listen to the dentist if he tells you, oh, it's 25 years old, it's done off-gassing mercury. No, it's not. It's putting inorganic, well, it turns the inorganic mercury in the brain. Those symptoms right there, that is the sign that you have a mercury issue. How many people go upstream and get the mercury out of the brain, which is the real cause of that? Glyphosate makes it worse. It allows it to cross deeper into the brain. And I have some studies there. Chemicals called obesogens that disrupt the hormones. That's why people can't lose weight. So, and I, I didn't have time to get into that, but they, the toxins come into the membranes, they inflame it, they blunt the hormone receptors. And it's the toxicity at the cellular level of why people can't lose weight, why people have hormonal dysfunction, don't feel well, have brain fog. It's a cellular problem. And I'll leave you this just so you can get more information. Okay, there, if you have, that's, a, that's a, how we look at cellular inflammation, but you can just do that on your phone real quick if you want, if you want help. That's if you want help yourself, if you have an issue. Just click that, or you can go to, um, I think it's, well, I switched it on me. Cellular solution. I can't remember. I just, you're going to have to do that. I don't want to screw it up. That's for practice. How many practitioners, coaches do we have here? We're doing a seminar in November. And for the first time, I'm certifying coaches. I've been training doctors for many, many years. Doctors, you're welcome to, of course. But now for the first time, even health coaches. So if you just do that one with your phone, uh, you can get information about that November seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.